Hey everybody, Pastor Mark here, coming to you from St. Luke and St. John Lutheran Churches in central Wisconsin. I am showing you some flowers that we have on display here in one of my churches because it is summertime and the flowers are blooming and it is just downright beautiful. Look at what God does and the artistry of his creation. These flowers also are a good reminder of what God does in us. Uh, not long ago, these flowers were just seeds or just stubble in the ground. And of course, they grew and then fully bloomed. And now they're showing the beauty to God's glory. Hey, thanks so much for joining me for this time. I pray that God would indeed make it worthwhile for us. Please do read the Bible readings that are on the next slide, especially focus on the epistle lesson, that second reading, because that will be the basis for our message. Thanks so much for being here. Well, this is a little bit different look for me, isn't it? Sitting in church wearing this cap here. Now, I don't know if you can see the name here. Let me try to get this in the camera. It says Chris's Barbershop, established, uh, what is it, 2003. And this is from, as you might imagine, a barbershop who's owned by a guy named Chris. And I have it on today because I want to make a little point about, well, my much bigger point that I'm going to make in a moment here. So what this is, uh, Chris is a guy that lives in Ohio, okay? I am in central Wisconsin. I do not get my hair cut at Chris's Barbershop. In fact, I've never even been to his barbershop. So why in the world am I wearing this hat? Occasionally, when I'm out and about with it on, somebody might ask me, they'll say, hey, where'd you get that hat? Where's Chris's Barbershop? Do I know that place? So I'm giving him advertising here, okay? But as I say, He's several states away from me in Ohio, not here in Wisconsin. So why am I wearing this hat? In fact, what good does the advertising do him? Probably not much. Not for us that live around here. Nobody's going to go over there to see him. Truth is, I wear this simply because Chris is a friend of mine. Yeah, and he does own a barbershop in Ohio. And I am glad to wear this because he gave it to me. Uh, he's a neat guy. I, I like he, him and his wife uh, and his child. They're wonderful people. And so I'm glad to wear this. It's a reminder of the friendship that I have. But it really doesn't do anything for Chris's business to have me wear this thing, okay? Here's the little point I'm making. Many of us call ourselves Christian. And we make a deal out of that. That is, uh, if somebody were to ask us, we'd probably say, yeah, we're, we're believers in Christ. Um, and perhaps they might find out about it if we mention in conversation about something about church or reading the Bible or whatever, all right? Many of us, however, and I'm making a generalization here, perhaps I shouldn't, but at least from the folks that I know and myself as well, we're not out there advertising that we're Christian. We're not showing it a whole lot. We're, we're not really doing much to let people see and to know that we're Christians. In fact, if truth be told, when we're hanging out with friends, you know, maybe at the bar or at some social function, many times we drink too much. A lot of times we're using really foul language as we're talking about things. Sometimes we're gossiping and tearing others down. Um, all of those things, none of that shows Jesus in our lives. It doesn't. It's just plain and simple. I don't always live in a way that reflects well on Jesus or lets people know that he is my Lord and my Savior. I'm guessing many of you go through that as well. Now, the point of this is not to make you feel guilty, all right? No, what I want to share with you today, the, the big point that I want to make, is if you looked at that epistle lesson from Paul's letter to the Colossians, he gives uh, lists of things. Um, let's see here. He says, put to death what is earthly in you. And here's part of the list. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. And, and he goes on from there. He says, put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. So... He's saying, 
Don't do this stuff anymore. That's not who you are. Don't behave this way because you are a Christian. Jesus lives in you. Don't behave like this. That's not the way we're supposed to be. Now, as I said, I'm not sharing this to make you feel guilty, but rather to get you to think about a truth. And that truth is this, that when we confront Jesus, when we have him in our life, when we have the gift of faith that reminds us we're forgiven, when we proclaim or confess or publicly state that we are in fact followers of Christ, there should be a transformation that takes place in our lives as well. That is, something should be different because we're Christian. To just have the name out there and say, oh yeah, I do this, I go to church, or I'm a Christian, or I read my Bible, I pray. It, it should be making a difference in us and how we act, how we live, how we treat others. Yeah, there should be something, if you will, kind of before Christ and after Christ in terms of our behavior. That is, I shouldn't be the same person because Christ is constantly working in me to make me more and more like him. That's why Paul says, put to death what is earthly in you. And he says prior to that, he says, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So the idea is that we should be living in a way that shows others Jesus in our lives. We should be transformed by Christ. Now, I realize that what I'm sharing here could be considered perhaps controversial or maybe, well, it can be easily misunderstood. So I want to clear a few things up right away here. The first one is this. I am not saying that any of you watching or any of the people in my associations who are saying they're Christians, I'm not saying they're not Christian. I'm not saying that they're not going to heaven or any of those things, okay? God is the one who determines that. That is not my call, it's not yours either. We are not the ones who say that's really a Christian or that person is going to heaven because of Jesus. They really believe him. No, that's God's call. And so that's where we leave it. But what I can see from God's word is that when Jesus is introduced to somebody and they receive his gifts of forgiveness, when they receive that gift of faith, it changes them. Do you remember the story of Zacchaeus? Um, I honestly, I don't remember where it is. Maybe Luke or something. It's in one of the Gospels. Look it up. You can look it up online. Look for Zacchaeus in the Gospels and it'll pop up for you. But the story of Zacchaeus is that he's a tax collector. And like most of the tax collectors at that time, he apparently, uh, what would be the word, extorted money or stole it simply from the people that he was taxing. And apparently the idea was at that time, the way it worked was, if you were a tax collector for the Roman, Emperor, uh, Roman Empire, you, say, had to collect 10% from people, and you would go around and collect 30%, and give Rome their 10, and you'd keep the rest, and you were really rich and wealthy that way. That's why tax collectors were so hated by people because they stole, they overcharged, they extorted money, and they probably had a couple of very large Roman soldiers with them who, you know, helped, helped them get that money when they asked for it. But they weren't honest people. They weren't doing their business honestly. Plus, when it came to Jewish people, the money that they're collecting for Rome, well, that's going to a pagan emperor and empire, that is, those who don't believe in, in the God of the Bible. So you're essentially supporting idol worship, supporting the worship of other false gods rather than the one true God. And of course, Jews didn't like that, especially when it was fellow Jews who were working as tax collectors. So anyway, Zacchaeus is a tax collector. He wants to meet Jesus. He's heard good things about him. And 
he's a tax collector who does what most tax collectors did at that time. He takes money, too much money, from the people. And then he meets Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm going to visit with you today. And Zacchaeus, his response to meeting Jesus, to, to having a, a, an experience with, with Christ, is to change his life. I'm going to pay back whatever I stole, and I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to live this way anymore. That's what he says. Again, go, go read the whole story. Find it in the Gospels. It's an amazing turnabout, amazing transformation. And the truth is, you see this a lot with God's, or excuse me, with the people that follow Jesus in that, in the, in the Bible. You see it a lot that they change. Jesus even says in that very famous scene that everyone likes to quote of uh, when, he, when the woman was brought to him, the one who was caught, caught in adultery, and she, uh, he says, well, she should be stoned. Go ahead, do it. Let he who is without sin throw the first stone. You remember that, right? Again, look that up if you need to. It's in there somewhere. And Jesus says, where are your accusers? Because they all, of course, left the stones and walk away because none of them is allowed to throw a stone at her because they are not sinless either. Um, <clears throat> and he says to the woman, where are your accusers? And she says, there aren't any. He says, fine, then neither do I condemn you. Isn't that great forgiveness? That's wonderful, right? He's not going to have her killed. That's, that's awesome. That's God's grace right there. But he also, at the very end of that thing, says one more line that we always seem to forget, and that is, now go and sin no more. See, the idea is that when we are in a relationship with Christ, when we have that gift of faith, that gift that, that assures us we are forgiven because of Jesus' death on the cross, and that we have life with him forever because of his resurrection from the dead, when we have that, that should have an impact on us. Now, once again, I want to be really clear here. I'm not suggesting that if you go out and get a little hammered on the weekends because you're drinking too much at a party, or if you're out there cussing like a sailor all the time, I'm not saying you're not going to heaven. I'm not saying you're not a true Christian. What I am saying, though, and what Paul says here, is essentially you are missing out on a big part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Forgiveness is great, but forgiveness doesn't just release us from the punishment and the guilt of sin, which it does, but it also gives us freedom from sin, freedom from the power of temptation and sin in our lives. And that should make a difference, folks. That should change us so that we don't give in to those things anymore. We don't need to talk with ugly profane language like everybody else does. We don't need to gossip and tear down others. We don't need to be selfish or to overindulge in the things of this world. No, we have the victory in Christ. We can live that. And if we're not doing that, we're missing out on some of the gifts that God gives us. Because the truth is, when we go against his will, that is, when we sin, we are harming ourselves. And so it's a good thing not to sin. Now, once again, let me make really clear. I do this stuff too, okay? I'm not suggesting that we are to be perfect. I'm not saying we can be perfect. We are still fallen, sinful people living in a fallen, sinful world. But I want to be in the battle. That is, I want to resist temptation as much as I can with God's help. You know, Paul, who writes this, he elsewhere in another one of his letters talks about the fact that he's in the battle too. And he has a line where he says, the things I want to do, I'm not doing. And the things I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. What a wretched man I am. And he's talking about his struggle with sin. We are going to give in. We are going to still be sinners as long as we're on this side of heaven. But that doesn't mean that we need to give in to that so freely and easily. It doesn't mean we need to live defeated lives. That is, well, I'm just going to sin anyway, so I may as well go at it with gusto. No, not at all. No, being in the battle against temptation and exhibiting that victory over the devil, that's part of the transformation that Christ gives us. So I hope that you will take to heart what Paul, in God's word, says here. 
Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So put to death what is earthly in you. Again, the list. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. Put off anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk. And you've got your own list, I'm sure. I know I do. But don't do those things anymore. Live in that freedom and victory that we have in Christ. Again, I'm not saying you're not going to heaven, and I'm not trying to make you feel guilty today. But rather, I want you to enjoy what God gives you in Jesus. And live with the freedom that you have from the tyranny of sin. Live with the freedom from sin. Not, not freedom to sin, mind you, but freedom from sin that Jesus gives to us so that you can enjoy even more fully the life God gives you now in Christ Jesus. Because not sinning is a good way to live. Yeah, following God's will, it's really good for us. He knows that. That's why he gave us the Ten Commandments and why he tells us to love one another and forgive one another and do all those things because it's good for us. Oh, and when we do it, we're letting people then see Christ at work in us. It's not just a name then, huh? No, it's a way of life. Live it well, my friends, and enjoy what you have in Jesus. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. We join our hearts in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gifts that you give us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Allow us, Lord, to live in the freedom that forgiveness gives us, the victory that Jesus' death and resurrection gives us, and live with the changed life that your Holy Spirit is working in us. Lord, we pray for those who are dear to our hearts. This week we celebrate with those who are enjoying birthdays and anniversaries. From our churches, we pray for Sandy Quinches, Maureen Kolstad, Jeff and Laura Humschold, Mark Morrison, David Householder, Barb Thiel, Jane Morrison, Connor Brandle, Laverne Weinfurter, and Dave and Vicki Rodney. We ask, Lord, that you would bless and keep them in your care. Lord, we pray for those who are hurting, those who are lonely, those who are sick. Grant your healing to them according to your will. Let them know your peace in a special way in their lives and let them know that you are with them and love them always. Lord, we pray for our world, for our world leaders, that they would govern with your wisdom, for war and strife that is happening in different places around the world. We ask that you would bring your peace into those situations. And for all those who are dealing with violence and struggling with loss, we ask, Lord, that you would give them protection and restore to them the things that they need for this life. Lord, we are grateful for all that we have in Christ Jesus, and we pray that you would strengthen us with your spirit to focus on the things that are important to you, because we know that they are good for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Once again, I am grateful to you for spending some time with me through this video, and I hope that it will get you thinking about, well, not just thinking about, but living out the faith that God has given you, living out the forgiveness that he has given you, the victory that is yours in Christ Jesus. Again, we are not here to determine whether you are a good Christian or whether I'm going to heaven or any of that. No, God is the one who decides that. And he has given that us that gift of faith and given us his son so that we do indeed have heaven and eternal life with him. What I hope you'll do is enjoy it. Enjoy his gifts and let them show in your life because they really are good for you. Thanks, my friends. God's peace to you always.